I stand for climate and gender justice in the Caribbean. Welcome to the Climate Conscious Podcast. I'm your host, Paula Joseph, and today we're joined by M. Christie for the Truth Be Told campaign. Tell us a bit about yourself and the work that you do. Sure thing. Um, so my name is M. Christie, and uh, first and foremost, I'm a PhD candidate at the State University of New York, College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Um, I'm from Jamaica, but I'm now living in New York, and I am a member of the LGBTQ community also. So my work um, pretty much centers both those things, being a Jamaican and being LGBTQ, being a small island, being from a small island, sorry, that's, you know, feeling the brunt of the climate crisis. Um, I work broadly with LGBTQ organizations and members of the LGBTQ community and members of academia to pretty much understand the ways in which LGBTQ and other ma- marginalized voices are left out of the conversation of climate in climate governance and broader environmental governance. So it's in a nutshell, I'm pretty much trying to raise the alarm that, you know, there are some of us who are not being considered when we talk about climate change response. So what inspires you to do the work that you do? Again, um, you know, just the the recognition that some people are left out of environmental and climate governance. So I started out as a chemist. Um, I, was, I was working in the lab for a couple of years and then I started to do consultancy. So I'm now in the field seeing the effects of certain environmental decisions and I'm going into these communities and seeing the differential impacts across different communities. Then I ventured into human rights and, you know, it just started stacking. Um, everything started stacking on each other in terms of the kinds of injustices that marginalized people were facing and getting into um, environmental advocacy with the Jamaica Climate Change Youth Council kind of just brought everything full circle. I never thought I'd be a climate advocate. Um, I'd never thought I'd be doing climate advocacy in this way, but um, just my experiences going out in the field, working on environmental impact assessments, seeing the the impacts of climate change um in Jamaica and other um small islands and you know in other developed countries also but then you see how certain communities are just left behind it once you see once you start to see the world in that light you can't unsee it and a part of me just felt like I'm, I you know the reason why my journey took the route it took was to lead me here, I needed to be a voice for these people who, one, don't have the knowledge of climate change, and two, um, don't have the privilege to be able to advocate for climate change because they are so focused on the immediate impacts of their disenfranchisement, such as living day to day. So I'm just inspired by, like, yeah, the experiences of my people and just being able to be a voice for them. Excellent. So, in your view, how are climate change and gender equality connected? So, gender equality is connected with everything. <laughs> um, so, from my, from the work that I'm doing, you know, the picture is becoming even more clear to me day by day that the way the world is structured is along it's along gender lines, it's along racial lines, and those two things are interconnected. There's there are some among us who think their identity is the is the baseline or the foundation or the the i think baseline is probably the right word from which we measure everything else and so you find that other genders and i'm talking about masculinity i i don't like to mince words or pretend like i'm mincing words so everything that's non-masculine tends to be subservient and treated as as less than and so you find that even with the climate crisis, it's so masculinist 
the solutions are masculinist, it's handed down um, from these patriarchal systems that cause the problem in the first place. And because of that, you know, and the, the how we've been programmed to think of gender in this binary, in this binary way, we shift from, you know, man to woman, male to female, and then we lose sight of the bigger picture where it's not just women who are othered and marginalized, it's everything else that's not a man. So we're talking about nature, we're talking about trans people, we're talking about LGBTQ people, effeminate males, masculine females, like the whole broad context of being gender othered is being left out of the conversation. And without that inclusion in the in, in the broader context of climate advocacy, um, the solutions will not come for those of us who are others. And so I feel like having gender equality under in the ways I've described it, so it's not just about you know women being centered, it's about all non-masculine identities being centered in climate change discourse. Um, that's the only way that we'll be able to see the big picture of what's causing the problem and what we really need to be doing to address it. So the next question we have is how can we create inclusive, resilient and sustainable Caribbean communities? Mm. The, the three buzzwords of the century, um, inclusive, resilient and sustainable. At f- the first thing we need to do is to figure out what those things mean for us. Um, sustainability and resilience have been, I think those have been handed down to the Caribbean um, by the developed world and we've just ran with it not taking into context our own cultural and geographical peculiarities, um, which play a big role in how we've been able to survive as, you know, a a sort of conglomerate of small nations, small islands, who often, you know, get left out or get the crumbs of whatever the developed world has left behind. Um, so yes, yeah, so the first thing we need to do is to figure out what inclusivity means, what resilience means, and what sustainable sustainability means in the context of being from the Caribbean. Um, and moving from there, I feel like you know Caribbean countries need to get back to our place of uh, integration and consensus building. We probably would, won't ever achieve consensus, but we can. I think we've agreed, we've achieved consensus on the big picture thing, which is that we are all at risk of losing our homes and our livelihoods from the climate crisis. Small islands are the first, will be the first to go when when the tipping point um, is realized. And so we need regional integration. We need to be pooling our resources. We need to be developing policies as a region that um, includes all our different contexts, all our different island cultures, Um, the different languages, the different identities. And again, going back to my previous point, taking that expansive view of gender and identities and make sure all of that is included in the conversation to move us forward as a stronger region with a stronger voice. Um, I don't know if I want to say a stronger seat at the table, but, you know, once we... Once we are doing this in unison as one voice, as a region, I feel like our solutions will be stronger and will be unstoppable when it comes on to um, to creating cl- um, change towards addressing climate change. Why is the Truth Be Told campaign and, let's say, other campaigns similar to this one is important to the Caribbean? So we have a story to tell as a region. Um, and again, the narratives of the clim- of, around, around the climate crisis Tend to be tend to center um, certain regions, certain identities, certain contexts, and the developed world. So, like one of the observations I made, um, maybe within the last two years, was that you know, the 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 real threats of climate change never became, um, never never got public interest until we started to see floods in places like China and Germany, um, and the U.S. That's kind of when the conversation became elevated that this thing is really real, despite, you know, I think it's Tuvalu. I don't want to say the wrong thing, but, you know, there are Pacific islands that were already um, being consumed by the sea. Um, People were already losing their livelihoods, but 
their stories weren't elevated until um, the global north developed countries started to feel the impacts of climate change as well. And so truth be told, um, the truth be told campaign is very important for us because our stories need to be told, our voices need to be elevated as a region. The world needs to recognize that all of us are being impacted by climate change and we have to sell the story. We have to continue selling the story that we aren't the problem. You know, we aren't the reason why we are having all of these high intensity um, flood events, uh, droughts, etc. But at the same time, our cultures, our identities, our livelihoods, our homes are the first in line to be destroyed. And many of us will not have anywhere to go after after that reality um, comes in effect. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Climate Conscious Podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Write to us at theclimateconscious at gmail.com or simply leave a review on your favorite app. Remember to follow The Climate Conscious on all social media platforms. See you next week.